He's a worthy God. A righteous God. An amazing God. Hallelujah. Anybody glad you pressed your way into the house of the Lord this morning? I was talking with somebody at the 8 o'clock service and they said they were struggling to get here, but they were glad they came. And I told them, I said, that happens to all of us. I encouraged them. I said, when that happens, I said, I want you to do something that I do. And they said, what is that, Pastor Deshaun? I said, let your curiosity kick in. They looked at me. They said, what do you mean? I said, in other words, when I am, you know, it's always a struggle to get to the house of the Lord sometimes, especially those of us that are not morning people. Um, but when there's an additional struggle, there's an additional weight of a fight, I said, let your curiosity kick in because the question I want you to begin asking is, what is the devil so afraid of? What, what, what's, what, what? I know, I know theologically he's not omnipresent, he's not all-knowing, he don't see the future. I know that, but sometimes I got to wonder, has he had a glimpse into what God has in store to the point that he's so afraid of what I am going to enter into that he would put up every block and roadblock and hindrance to get me from getting into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so, if that happens, any of you, I want your curiosity to kick in. What, what, what does the enemy not want me to get? That when I get it, I'll become even more lethal. I'll become even more dangerous. I'll walk further into my purpose, into my calling. And so, amen, the presence of God is in this place. And let me just go ahead and set protocol. God bless you all. It's the First Baptist, Murfreesboro. I bring you greetings from Second Baptist Church in Reno, Nevada, where we love God, serve people, and present Jesus. A church that is dedicated to changing lives and communities through a culture of caring and connecting people to Christ. I know that there are a few people from our church logging on. So hello, Second Baptist. If you're on Second Baptist, let's go ahead and say hey in the chat. And to your pastor. To your pastor, to your pastor, Reverend James McCarroll. I call him Reverend Doctor. Come on, you can celebrate. Hallelujah. Your pastor. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. We've, we've known each other for a few years, and I'm grateful that the friendship and the connection that we are developing is not just one of those things that you say at National Baptist. <laughs> hey, Doc, you know, I'm going to get you over. Okay. Amen. But, amen, he's a man of his word, and so we have stayed connected. And I'm just inspired to be here today, just inspired to be with you all today. I'm taking pictures. So if y'all see me taking pictures, it's because I'm going back and talking to my team in, in Reno. Amen. Uh, but God bless you. Um, I'm going to apologize to the AV team. Um, I gave you one scripture, um, but as I was sitting here, the Holy Ghost said, that's not what I want you to preach. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm changing it, so it will not, it may not be for you on the screen, and so, but um, I got to, what I've learned about preaching and pastoring is, um, anybody ever dealt with the, the USPS, you know, United States Postal Service? Somebody said, yes, we have. <clears throat> Here's what I've learned as a mail carrier. If the mail carrier does his or her job right, their job is just to deliver the mail. And then, um, but if the mail is tampered with, if by some chance when you receive the mail and it's the contents of the package are not right or they've been damaged, then you go back to the mail carrier and you fussing and hemming and hawing over your damaged package, right? But if they do their job right and they deliver the contents of the package correctly, then you don't go back to the mail carrier, you respond to the sender. As preachers of the gospel, we are just mail carriers. And at the end of the service, at the end of the message, if we've messed with it, y'all coming to talk to us. But if we've delivered it correctly, then you'll go to the sender. And my job today is to help point you to the sender. 
And so God has sent a word in this place. And we're going to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. To all of the team who, who serves to make worship possible, to make ministry possible, we know that it doesn't happen by one person. Thank you so much for your service. And I'm a musician at heart, so y'all just set me up. I had to remember I'm here to preach today. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 5. And I've got a bit of reading to do because I want to I wanna read so that you have context. So when we get to going, you'll understand. Second Kings chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 20 in the New International Version of Scripture. And there you'll find words recorded like these. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and, have, and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and uh, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know. <laughs> that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Listen to what Naaman did. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out and give me, come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned off and went into a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, this is what I like about them. You can't have all yes people around you. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Verse 15, we're almost done. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let your servant be given as much earth or dirt as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never make again burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimen to bow down and he is leaning on my arm and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Verse 19, go in peace, Elisha said. God has entitled this word dirty faith. Dirty faith. Look at somebody and say, dirty faith. You may have your seats. Amen. 
We know, if you've been in church any length of time, the writer of Hebrews tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The New International Version puts it like this. It says, now faith is being, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's easy to have faith when everything is going right. It's easy to have faith when there's money in the bank. Easy to have faith when your marriage is pristine. Easy to have faith when all of your children are doing well and there's a there's a doctor's report, and it's, it's a clean bill of health. Uh, the, 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 it's easy to have faith in those moments, and sometimes it's even easy to have faith when we're sitting here at 11 o'clock worship, when the Spirit of God is moving, and we're lifting our hands, and we're saying yes to God. But the question we must ask ourselves is, um, do we still have that level of faith when things are not favorable? There is, there's a group that I'm associated with in Reno called KP5. It stands for Kingdom Partners 5. There's five churches that are diverse in nature, diverse in ethnicity, diverse in culture. And as we were having one of our group meetings, one of the, one of the people from one of the churches comes to me as I was sitting there eating at the picnic. And he said to me, he said, this is my wife. And he gives her name and he says, but, but I had another wife and she passed. And she, she lived with cancer for, for 10 years, over 10 years. And at the beginning of her diagnosis, we all were praying for healing and God to take the cancer away. And, and, and we could see that her cancer was progressing. It was getting worse. And, and things, were not, the, things were not working as we would have hoped there, they would. And he was still praying for God to completely heal and deliver her from this diagnosis, from this cancer, from this tumor. And one day she, she was in the bed and they were waking up and she rolled over to her side of the bed and she was looking at him as he was was trying to help her get ready for her day and she says it takes more faith not to be healed than it does to be healed it takes more faith not to be healed than it does to be healed in other words what she was saying it's been well over five years at this point and God has not healed me of this cancer she said I could have left him a long time ago I could have left him 60 months ago when I got the initial diagnosis but what I have learned is even though the cancer has not dried up even though I'm still dealing with it the praise is that the, the praise that I have is I'm not gone <laughs> the praise that I have, the worship that I have, is God has somehow sustained me beyond what the doctors originally gave me. And that's what I want to tell you today, that sometimes God moves us into areas of faith that challenge us, that, that move us outside of our comfort zone. This morning, I preached about God being the ultimate creative. I preached about the divine design and how God is, is challenging this church to move into a place that will literally turn Murfreesboro upside down and be a light and a beacon for him. But can I tell you that in order to do this first, Baptist you got to sometimes have dirty faith dirty faith and this is where we find ourselves in today's text that Naaman had to have dirty faith and let me talk about the fact of the matter that here, here's my first point that it's hard sometimes to have dirty faith when you have one public greatness look at the text the Bible says that he was the commander of the army of the king of Aram the text tells us that he was a great man in the sight of his master. The text also says that he was highly regarded. He was a valiant soldier. He was all of these things. He was great in other people's eyes, y'all. But how many know that sometimes, even though we have public greatness, point number two, we also have private grief. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He was great in the eyes of his army, but he had leprosy. 
He was great in the eyes of the king of Aram, but he had leprosy. He was great because God used Naaman to bring military victory to Aram against Israel. And the question I have is why would God use Naaman to bring victory to Aram when they're Israel's enemy? I'm glad you asked. But put a pin in there, I'm going to come back and get you. Because let me go ahead and add this, that sometimes doesn't it seem when you're trying to do the right thing for God that your enemies are prospering when you're over here doing the right thing. I'm coming to Sunday school, I'm coming to Bible study, I'm coming to worship, I'd impress my way, I'd given up my, all my other ways, and it seems like those people who have no regard for God or hear the things of God seem to be doing better than those of us that are trying to do the right thing. We have some private griefs. Uh, leprosy, as we know it, is a skin disease that through, that through times caused people to lose fingers and toes and eventually limbs. Those dealing with leprosy were typically treated as outcasts because the disease was incurable and believed in some cases to spread through touch. This is why lepers were generally outcasts. In his article, Biblical Leprosy, Shedding Light on the Disease that Shuns, Dr. Alan L. Gillen points out that leprosy in the Hebrew text could mean a number of different skin ailments. It may not have been this specific disease, but this word is used to describe any skin condition that was not normal. If, though, however, it was that leprosy that was degenerative, then Naaman is in trouble. And Naaman is in trouble because this condition was not just cosmetic or external, it was internal. And here is why, because not only does leprosy cause a loss of limbs, it also damages the nerves to the point where leprosy patients can no longer feel pain. In other words, they do not know if they've damaged themselves because they've lost the ability to sense pain. Dr. Gillen in this article goes further. He states, he said, studying leprosy helps us to see why pain is a valuable gift. A survival mechanism to warn us of danger in this cursed world. Without pain and suffering, we might be like lepers unable to recognize that something is terribly wrong and that we are in need of the healing touch of God. As Dr. Brand said, I cannot think of a greater gift that I could give my leprosy patients than the gift of pain. And that's what I want to stop here and pause for a moment because sometimes many of us are asking God to remove the pain, take the burden away, move it I, I, I can't deal with it but here we see that when you have leprosy you automatically go numb huh but is there anybody in here that says pastor Deshaun I'm beginning to see why God sometimes does not remove the pain because when I'm in pain it lets me know that I'm in trouble and that I need someone who is greater than me to come and touch me and heal me Oh, can I go ahead and give you a Bible for this? Uh, it was Paul's pain from the thorn that led him to God. It was Jesus' pain on the cross that led him to cry out for the Father. It was the stomach pain that I had in 1993 that led me to the doctor to find out that I needed my appendix removed. It was the chest pain in 1987 that led my uncle to the doctor to find out that he needed open heart surgery. It was the pain that led my God sister to the hospital to discover that she needed gallbladder surgery. And do I have any biological mothers in the house? It's the pain that will signal you that it's time for your baby to be born. Uh, somebody here but I ought to go ahead and say God I thank you for the pain I couldn't thank you yesterday I was mad at you I, I, I almost kicked you to the curb but God I thank you 
you for the pain. David says in Psalm 119, 70 and 71, he says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn my, thy statutes. The purpose of my pain is it signaled me that I needed help and that help is found in God through his son, Jesus Christ. Come here, Andre Crouch. Andre Crouch said, I thank God for the mountains and I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms that he's brought me through. Why? Because if I had not had these problems, I would not know that God could solve them. I would not know what faith in his word would do. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. And is there anybody in here that can go ahead and say, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Is there 10 people in here? And I'll make 11 that can just go ahead and say, God, thank you for my pain. I want to thank you for the car and for the house and for all this, but can I thank God for the foreclosure? And thank you for the eviction. Thank you for the bad health diagnosis. Thank you for not, not th I thank you for my friends and my family, but God, thank you for my haters. Thank you for all the people that talked about me. Why? Because the text tells us in the Psalter that he prepares a table before me in the presence of all my enemies. In other words, why you ought to thank God for the pain? Because when God decides to bless you, according to the Psalter in the 23rd division of Psalms, when God gets ready to bless you in my homiletical imagination God sends out invitations to all the people who talked about you who scandalized you who said you would never amount to anything who said you were good for nothing he invites them all to the table and when they get to the table they said why in the world am I here do you know why I'm here no do you know why you're here no but all of a sudden here comes goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life and guess what I'm the guest of honor at the table that's been spread over all the people that inflicted me of my pain is there anybody that can give God praise because God is preparing a table before you in the presence of all of your enemies Here's why, third point, here's why you ought to praise God for your pain, because Naaman's pain led him to three, point three, pursue guidance. He had to pursue guidance. Let me remind you, he had public greatness, private grief. He needs help. The king of Aram sends a letter to the king of Israel that Naaman needs healing. In order to receive his healing, listen to me clearly, in order for Naaman to receive his healing, okay, I'll make sure, in order for Naaman to receive his healing, uh, he had to leave his environment. Some of us can't receive our healing because we refuse to leave our environment. And could it be the reason why God says I cannot heal you is because it's not the fact that you're toxic, it's that the environment is toxic. And if I go ahead and heal you and get you cleaned up, but you're inhaling all of the toxins from the environment that you keep on getting reinfected. Has God been telling somebody, you got to move away from them people. You got to shut that down. Huh? You got to go ahead and give off of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, MySpace, if you still got it, get off of it. God is telling somebody of you to move from Nashville to Murfreesboro God is telling some of you to go ahead and cut off some of those people that you have in your phone as a matter of fact don't even put them on block just go down to T-Mobile Sprint Verizon Boost whoever and just go get a get a brand new number as a matter of fact they may not be just go get ahead a brand new phone because you got too many people still up in there God says if you want to be healed sometimes you got to leave where you are and get to where God is trying to heal.
he had to leave his environment. And let me just give you this advice. It's not on my notes. But if you're like me, you struggle with acceptance. And it's not so much acceptance, Pastor McCarroll, but I struggle sometimes because I want everyone to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the Holy Ghost said to me about a year ago, he said, why do you keep wasting your energy on people that are never going to understand who you are in the first place? Why are you wasting your energy on trying to say, well, this is why I'm doing this and this and I do this and all kinds of stuff and all kinds of stuff and all that kind of stuff and do this and do this and do that and do that. And he said the people that supposedly have your back, are really, uh, are having your front, is really stabbing you in your back. And when you turn around, they're like, oh, somebody stabbed you in your back. Oh, but you're the one that held the knife. He said, why are you wasting your energy on trying to explain to people who never want to see you succeed? He said, you just got to go and do what I've called you to do without explanation or apology. Look at somebody and say, stop apologizing. Stop apologizing for what God is trying to do. He's trying to bring you up. He's trying to move you out. He's trying to go ahead and break all the generational curses in your family. And somebody's got to be the one that breaks the family, the family generational curses. Oh, no. They got pregnant the last three generations. It stops with me. They got sick the last four generations. It stops with me. They were in poverty the last ten generations. It stops with me. And sometimes God's got to move you to heal you. king of Aram sends this letter to the king of Israel when he does this the king of Israel tears his clothes Elisha hears about it and says why'd you do that tell him to come to me and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel the way that the king reacts we he thinks that this is a deliberate attack because remember Aram had defeated Israel earlier in this whole uh, chronicle so we can assume through the reading of the text that these two nations were most likely not at peace with each other. Uh, throughout 1 Kings, the Arameans are indeed Israel's enemy, but sometimes God will flip the switch on your enemies. The Bible says that, that Elisha says, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Uh, uh, in other words, if there's a prophet in Israel, then there is a living God in Israel. In other words, he's not trying to get the big head. He's not trying to say subscribe to my YouTube page and go ahead and pay your $10 for this holy water that I really got from my faucet and something's going to happen. He said, no, if he knows there's a prophet in Israel, then he knows there's a God in Israel and not some idol, not some stone, not some marble. He knows there's a true and a living God in Israel. How many of you know that sometimes God will flip the switch and make your enemies your footstool? Sometimes God, the people that talked about you the most are the people now coming to you and asking you to pray for them. And now all of a sudden you know why you couldn't cuss them out back then in 2014. Because if you cussed them out back then, when they come to you now, they wouldn't want to hear your prayer. But God held your tongue back. God held your fist back. God told you to put the phone down because all of a sudden your enemies are the ones that are coming to you for help. Naaman gets to the house of Elisha. Elisha don't even come out. He sends a messenger. The message is, go and dip in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be clean and restored. Naaman is upset, y'all. Naaman said, I thought he would have come out and waved his hand over me. And called the name on his God. He would have, oh, and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm upset because he didn't call me down to the altar. I'm upset because he didn't call me by my name. I'm, I'm upset because he didn't run down my address and my zip code. I'm upset because he didn't do all of these shenanigans. And let me just say this, that I, I believe in the healing miracles. I believe in prophecy. But sometimes we are in a place where we want more emotionalism than we want God. Secondly, he says... Not only did he not come out, but the rivers of Damascus are better than the rivers of Jordan. In other words, those, 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 those rivers of Jordan are nasty. They're dirty. These other ones are cleaner. Why would you send me to the clean rivers? 
And this is what we have to be careful of. Is sometimes the reason why we can't receive our healing is because we're so busy dictating to God how we should be healed. We can't receive our breakthrough, we can't receive our deliverance, we can't receive our, we can't receive our promise because we're telling God our prayer is not God make me ready, our prayer is God do it just like this. We want to dictate to God how he should heal us, how he should free us, how he should move us from one place to the next. No, that's not your job. And here's the reason why I want to suggest that he's saying this is because he's operating in his public greatness still. And here's how you know that because the narrator says that he comes up to the door with his horses and his chariots. Even though he had private grief, he was still coming to be healed in his public greatness. And sometimes that's where God, that's a point for us to see is that sometimes our pride needs to come down before God can completely heal us. That's why God says sometimes you need dirty faith. Because if I told you to do all this kind of things, I told you to to jump up three times and run around all this kind of stuff. If I told you to do all this kind of stuff, that's what you want to do. But when I but when I say that your healing is coming through you being able to go ahead and love the people that have talked about you, when I tell you that your healing is coming through the to to, to pray for those that despitefully use you, when I tell you that your healing is coming through not your speaking in tongues, but the same Holy Ghost that allows you to speak in tongues on Sunday will allow allow you to ask for forgiveness on Monday dealing with his pride so we have to be careful and this is what I like about his servants his servant said had he asked you to do something great when you have done it but what he asked you to do was simple and humbling Bible says that he dips in the Jordan, the the dirty Jordan, the muddy Jordan. If you go to Jordan right now and you see how murky it is, you don't want to drink your water from the Jordan. It's dirty. It's nasty. (laughs) But God sometimes uses dirty things to clean us. He dips. I feel the Holy Ghost. He dips seven times seven is the number of completion (laughs) I told you this morning that the ending word at nine at eight o'clock was you're going to have to complete what God has sent you to do and here we see another level of completion that he had to dip seven times and to complete this thing and the Bible says that that he was healed as he did it and this time he goes back and meets with Elisha and he tries to pay Elisha but Elisha won't take payment because the purpose of Naaman's visit was to fourth and final point was to perceive God verse 15 Naaman says now I know that there is no other God in the world besides Israel. Naaman has a conversion experience. Uh, David Guzik said it like this. He said, not only does he believe in Yahweh or God, but he states that there is no other God. David Guzik says it is, is it wasn't just the healing that persuaded Naaman. It was the healing connected to the word of the prophet. This was evident that the God Elisha represented was the true God in all the earth. I told you this morning at 8 o'clock that, that God operates by speech act theory, meaning that his words are his actions. If we came into this building, we say, let there be light, we'd have to go to the back and flip a switch or, or light a candle or something. We, we, are, we would have to have actions that followed our, our, what we said. But God says what he means. And he means what he says. When God said, let there be light in Genesis, he didn't have to go flip a switch because his word did the action. And what I've come to let you know on today is that whatever the word is that God has spoken over your life, you got to go back to the word because the word is set to go forth and to do the very thing it's accomplished to do. Ah, So he has to perceive God. And this brings me back to my question I posed in the introduction. Uh, 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 Why would God use Naaman to bring victory to Abram? 
I know that you've been waiting on the edge of your seats for me to answer this question. Do you want me to answer the question? Uh, why would God use Naaman to bring victory to Abram when Abram was the direct adversary or the direct enemy of Israel? Well, I'm glad that you asked because if God had not given them those victories, then there would have never been, there would never have been an Israelite girl taken captive. And if that little Israelite girl had not been taken captive, she would have not been serving Naaman's wife. And had she not been serving Naaman's wife, she would have never noticed that Naaman had leprosy. And had she not noticed that Naaman had leprosy, she would have never told his wife that there was a prophet in Samaria. And had the wife not told Naaman there was a prophet in Samaria, he would have never gone to the king of Aram. And had he not gone to the king of Aram, he would have never written a letter to the king of Israel. And had the king of Israel not received the letter, then Elisha would have never told him to come to his house. And had he not gone to his house, he would have never been met by a messenger to tell him to dip in the Jordan. And had he not dipped in the Jordan, he would have not been healed. And had he not been healed, he wouldn't have tried to pay Elisha. And had Elisha not refused payment, Naaman wouldn't have asked to carry the dirt from Israel back to Abram. And had he not carried the dirt back from Israel to Abram, he would have still kept on worshiping Remen instead of Yahweh. In other words, God pursued Naaman through his sickness to establish relationship with him and to let him know that he was not just the God of Israel. He was also the God of Naaman. He was also the God of the universe. He was not not just Elisha's God he was also Naaman's God and is there anybody in here that can say I thank God because he pursued me just to love me look at somebody say he pursued me just to love me he pursued me when I was in drugs he pursued me when I was blaming it on the act alcohol he was pursuing me huh, through the disappointment huh, he was pursuing me huh, through the cancer diagnosis huh, he was pursuing me huh, through fibromyalgia huh, he was pursuing me huh, through congestive heart failure he was pursuing me huh, through the dialysis treatment huh, he was pursuing me huh, through low self-esteem huh, he pursued me huh, through the divorce huh, he pursued me huh, through the suicide attempt huh, he pursued me huh, through the four closure. He pursued me through the eviction. He pursued me through the layoff. He pursued me through the furlough. And is there anybody that can say that God pursued me through the pandemic? If they're in here today and you're grateful that God pursued you just to love you, you ought to go ahead and lift up your hands and say God thank you for pursuing me when I didn't love myself when I didn't think I would amount to anything God pursued me how do you know the Bible says that God commanded his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us the Bible says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life can I tell you the Bible verse that blesses me the Bible says that I consider that our presence and sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God all the things the good things the bad things the embarrassing things all of them are working together just for my good is there anybody that can say I thank God that everything uh, that I'm going through uh, is working uh, for my good. In other words, uh, can I go ahead uh, and tell you whatever blesses me? Uh, what else blesses me uh, is Paul uh, says uh, at the end of chapter 8 uh, in the book of Romans, uh, he says, what then uh, shall separate us uh, from the love of God uh, in Christ Jesus uh, shall trouble uh, shall hardship shall persecution shall famine 
shall nakedness, shall danger, or sword, no, and all these things, we are more than a conqueror through him that loved us, for I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, no powers, nor height, nor depth can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Can you help me give God a great big praise? God, thank you for everything. Thank you for the pain. Thank you for the embarrassment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. You've been a mother. You've been a father. You've been a sister. You've been a brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, God. Do I have anybody that can say thank you? You've been good. Thank you. You've been mighty good. Muchas gracias. Ta-ta, senor. Thank you. If God has been good, you ought to get out in the aisle and just start saying through many dangers, toils and stairs, get out in the aisle and start taking a look back over your life. He brought me to Jim Crow. Brought me through segregation brought me through unemployment is there anybody that can give God 60 seconds of praise that's good for me but this is the God that kept you when you didn't want to keep yourself come on anybody in the balcony I want to see how real it is so musicians, if you got to give God praise, I want you to give God praise. Get off the instruments because it's time for you to give God praise. Is there anybody in the building that has a real praise? I told you stop playing because I want to see something. Because if it's real, you don't need the E-flat. You don't need the organ. You don't need the drums. You don't need the bass. All you need is a memory when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all, all, all he's done for me. My soul says hallelujah. Thank you for saving me. When I think, the more I think, the more I think, the more I think, the more I think, come on. That's it, keep worshiping, come on. Keep worshiping.
Those of you that need something from the Lord, I want you to make your way up here right now. You came in this place because you needed something from the Lord. Some of you said, I'm frustrated. I, I'm at my wit's end. If God doesn't do it, it's not going to get done. <clears throat> I even rebuke suicidal ideation right now. Those of you that may not know what that is, that's a clinical term. It doesn't mean you're, you're ready to commit suicide. It means that you're contemplating it. I'm not going to ask who that is because I hear it clearly in the spirit. But we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Let me go ahead and say this, that just because you have suicidal ideation and all this, it doesn't mean that God loves you any less. It doesn't mean that you're any less saved. It just means you have real issues. And sometimes we make a permanent decision for a temporary inconvenience. I took a class last year, Crisis and Suicide, that helped reshape my lens in the church. As we were reading through the Psalter, my professor pointed out that there was suicidal ideation in the Psalter. She was asking, why would God allow this to be entered into the canon? Why would he allow this to be included in the Bible? We concluded in that it's because some people don't believe that God is still real and relevant. That sometimes we have painted or given a theology that, that makes this Christianity walk just all dancing through the daisies and tip throwing to the tulips. But how many of you know we still got real issues. We still got real problems. As a matter of fact, can I go ahead and be real? When I gave God my real yes, all hell broke loose in my, in my life. And I said, I was doing better with the no than this yes. I was tired of struggling with the enemy. I was tired of struggling, going to bed, sleeping for eight hours and getting up, waking up more tired than I was when I laid down because even though my eyes were closed, the enemy was fighting me in my mind. Many days I wanted to say, forget all this. I'm throwing in the towel on ministry. I, I, I don't want to be here. Forget these church people because they was being all holy and sanctimonious. And I'm like, I got real issues. C come on. You got to praise him. I don't have a praise in me. I don't feel like praising him right now. I need to know that this God is concerned about more than my apostolic, my prophet, my pastor. My, I need God. I need to know, is this God still, is, is he concerned about Deshaun and not Pastor Deshaun? Not Elder Deshaun? Is he concerned about me when I leave these four walls or does he want to use and abuse me only to make y'all jump and shout? As I began to read through scripture, I began to see that he allowed these things to stay in scripture so that we could see that he's a God that can handle every element of who we are. This is what I love about God. You know that's you know, that, 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 the psalm, I, I, I lifted my eyes to the hills from what's come from my help, my help coming from the Lord. When it gets to that part that said he, he will not allow the the moon to harm me by night and the, the, the air, excuse me, the, the sun by day and the moon by night, that he becomes my shade. Here's what I love about God, is God doesn't send help. Help me preach. He is your help. He don't, he don't, he don't send, it. he is that help. And so I want to set this up because God is doing some healing this morning. And we're going to pray. And the reason why I told musicians to get off the, you know, get off the instrument, because sometimes when I was on that roll, I needed something from the Lord. 
but I couldn't get it because I had a sustained atmosphere. And so that's why I tell musicians, I said, if you need it, go ahead and get it because we don't need the music to go ahead and do what God needs to do in this part. Amen. So right now where you are, I see some of you holding hands, whatever your posture is to receive, lifting hands. I see some people in the aisle getting ready to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. So let's get ready to receive. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for today. For God, before we ask you for anything, we just want to say thank you. You thought so much about us that you would interrupt our schedule and insert your agenda. Father, it's always about you. But Father, we say thank you because when you manifest in a corporate setting, you do more than to come to make us run and jump. You come to meet a need. So Father, thank you on today for meeting this need. Father, I thank you for meeting the needs on today. Father, right now we come because we're in need of healing. Father, some of us need healing emotionally. We need healing financially. We need healing in our families. We need healing, Father, mentally. Father, we need healing spiritually. Father, we need you. Father, some of us today, Father, barely made it here because we're in pain. Not just necessarily physical pain, but we are in emotional pain on the inside. We want to scream, but we can't scream because we're in so much pain. Father, the pain of remembering, the pain of our past, the pain... Father of the unknown, the fear of not just, not, not just failure, but the fear of success. God, can we keep it going? So, Father, I pray for healing right now. Father, I give, we give you permission to, Father, do surgery on us. In the name of Jesus, some of us have been trying to do over-the-counter spiritual remedies. But Father, today, NyQuil ain't going to get it. Tylenol ain't going to get it. Father, we need to go under the night, the spiritual night. Father, thank you. Today, you are getting not to the symptom, but you're getting to the core of the issue. I need one of the women of God right now to come forward. You're you going to help me pray right here? I need you to come over here and just hug this young lady right now while we're praying because God's doing something major in her life. He's about to do a major release. Father, right now, we give you permission. We sign the consent form to do surgery. I need you to hug her real tight. The Lord says she just needs to be safe. Huh? The Lord says you're safe, daughter. You're safe. He says you're safe, my sister. You're safe. You're safe in this place. Hallelujah. Father, we don't want to go under, we don't want to go into surgery because God, that means we're out of control. It means that we no longer have control. We must relinquish control. So Father, I pray that as we're praying, help us to sign the spiritual consent form. We give you permission to do what you need to do, how you needed to do it, when you need. Father, we give you permission because how we've been trying to handle it has not been working. It's not been effective. We're still in the same place 10 years later. So, Father, we pray that once you do this surgery, once you get to this root cause, that we don't go back and pick it up. Father, Thank you for the gift of pain that lets us know that we need help. That lets us know that we have to surrender to you. That the scripture is true now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly far above all that we ask I think according to the power that works in us and so father I pray that once you get to the root cause you deal with us father don't leave us open don't let us bleed to death father thank you because not only are you with us in the surgery but you're also in the recovery room. 
And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of pain that let me know that I needed help. But I want to say thank you for the gift of pain to let me know <laughs> that the surgery worked. There's a difference, First Baptist, between the pain of being inflicted and the pain of recovery. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that as we are recovering, as we're moving into this new place that you have for us, Father, help us, Father, to rejoice in the fact that we are in pain from recovery. And some of us have to be rehabilitated. And, Father, as you're rehabilitating us, Father, thank you that you love us so much that you will reteach us how to love. You will reteach us how to walk. You will reteach us how to pray. You will reteach us how to worship. You will reteach us how to forgive. You will reteach us, Father, how to do those things that we took for granted. Father, we say thank you because you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. Father, we say thank you because, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us father we say thank you because the lord is my life and my salvation whom shall i fear the lord is the strength of my life of whom shall i be afraid we say thank you because father you are good and your mercy endures forever father we say thank you thank you father on today now father lastly as we're here at this altar, and those of you that could not make your way to this altar, wherever you are, if you need God to do something, Father, we lay every issue, every weight at this altar. We lay it. We, we willingly give it over to you. You have permission to do with it. And I hear the Holy Ghost say to do with them as you will. Father, as we close, we want to close with the same way that we opened. And that is with thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so kind that you would, that you would ordain this moment to have interaction with you, that you would allow us to interact with you corporately and individually at the same time. Thank you. Because you're a God that can touch all of us at the same time. Thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that prayer, come on and just thank God in this place. Thank him. He's a worthy God. Can I have one of the mothers of the church hug this young lady right here? Just this young lady right here. The Lord says it's all right. The Lord says today you can breathe again. The Lord says today exhale because I've got this. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise, Pastor the Son? We're going to do this, a couple of things. One, we want to open the opportunity to provide the opportunity for anyone who wants to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ or those who may want to become a member of First Baptist Church. You're saved, you've already given your life to Christ, but you need a church home. So you don't want to walk around with gifts and not have them used in the context of the body of believers. So if today you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ or if today you want to make First Baptist Church your church home, listen. On the back, of the, in the back of your pew, you'll see a card. Can we give God some praise? There may be another. If that's you today, just come on. We'll do it this way. If there's another who wants to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and wants to make this your church home, right where you are, if you're too far away, you want to say, I, I'll just stand. That's okay. I can stand. If, you, if that's you, just stand up right where you are. God bless you. I see you, my sister. For those who don't want to stand on the back of your pew, there's a card that's called a connect card. You can just scan that little QR code uh, that says join the FBC family. You scan that code, fill out the information, or come to our team and we'll get back with you immediately. But for those who have given your life to Christ and who have become a part of this church family on behalf of the First Baptist Church, we just want to say welcome to First Baptist. Can we give God some praise for our new family members? If you'd like to come down now, you can do that.
Um, for those who have come down, you can go to my right and your left. Just get your belongings, bring them with you. Again, can we give God some praise for our new family members? Amen. As they come, we're going to prepare the worship of God in our giving. If you've given online, you can just raise your hand. If you want to give via envelope, there's an envelope in the back of your pew. Fill out that information. If you want to put in there, you can put cash, good checks, uh, and Monday orders. God bless you. But uh, we encourage you to, to fill out that envelope. Uh, the third way you want to give, you can text to give. You can text We Impact to 888-364-GIVE. Uh, and that will allow you to be able to give via your cell phone. It makes it a lot easier for those who may not carry cash um, in this day and time. So if you can give, God bless you. God bless you. So I want to pray for you. If you'd keep that hand lifted, Father, we thank you for the gifts that are about to be given. Bless the givers according to the principles and promises for giving in the word of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that all believing get done and the people of God said together. Amen. The only thing I want to do now is take a moment and just remind you in your prayer time this week to lift up those families. As you know, uh, 22 years ago, 21 years ago on this day, uh, the, the planes flew into the Twin Towers and there were a lot of lives that were lost. Soon thereafter, there was a, a military conflict. There were a lot of lives that were lost and a lot of people's lives have been changed because of 9-11. So I encourage you in your prayer time today to lift up those families who lost loved ones or had loved ones seriously injured or impacted by the 9-11 events. Also, we want to thank God for our military, thank God for our first responders, and thank God for our airline workers who had to endure and work alongside that. So we thank God for that. That's it. If our hearts and minds are clear, let's stand. Let's stand. Tell your neighbor, I'm so glad to worship with you today. Yeah, stretch it out, stretch it out. Y'all like, yeah, my knees. I got the energy. Y'all ready? Here we go, First Baptist. May the Lord bless you. Sing it. May the Lord keep you. Everywhere you go. I pray that you'll be blessed. This time, look at that neighbor. Tell them, may the Lord. Don't leave yet. You won't leave before the prayer. Everywhere you go. I pray that you'll be blessed. One other person, find one other person around you. Tell them, may the Lord. May the Lord keep you. Everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Three parts. Everywhere you go. One more time. Everywhere you go. I pray that you'll be blessed. Grab that neighbor's hand, grab that neighbor's hand. Father, we thank you for this time together. As we leave this place, but never your presence, we pray that you would cover and keep each of us. Use our lives this week to be the light of the world and the salt of this earth. Everywhere you send us this week, we trust that it's not by chance, but it's with intentionality. So Lord, let us see it as an opportunity to be the church in that space. We thank you in advance for everything you have in store for our lives this week. Use us to the praise of your glory to bring lives to know the truth about the heart of Jesus Christ. Through our encounter with them, let your love shine. Let your love be present and ultimately let your love impact their lives for you. In Jesus' name we ask it all my brothers and sisters, may the love of God, the peace of God and the grace of God rest, rule and abide with each of you till we meet again on this side or in glory. And all who received it, received it by saying amen, amen, and amen. Hug that neighbor. Tell them have a wonderful week. God bless you.
right, so I know you were blessed by the content. I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you enjoyed the video, hit that like button. And if you want to see more content in the coming weeks, hit that notification bell. We were so glad to have you sharing with us today. And we do pray that the Lord will continue to bless you, your family, and those you impact on a daily basis. Take care.